Chapter 65 The Judgment It was a dark and stormy night. Large clouds careered across the heavens, veiling the brightness of the stars. The moon would not arise till midnight. Sometimes, by the light of a flash that shone along the horizon, the road became perceptible, stretching itself white and solitary before them, and then the flash extinguished, everything again was gloom. At every instant, Athos was obliged to check D'Artagnan, who was always at the head of the little troop, and to compel him to take his place in the rank which, a moment afterwards, he quitted again. He had only one thought, to go forward, and he went. They passed in silence through the village of Festubert, where the wounded servant had been left, and then they skirted the village of Richbourg. Having reached Herlier, Planchette, who guarded the party, turned to the left. On several occasions, either Lord de Winter or Porthos or Aramis had endeavored to address some remark to the man in the red cloak, but at each interrogation he had bowed his head without reply. The travelers had thus comprehended that there was some reason for the stranger's silence, and they had ceased to address him. The storm, too, became more violent. Flashes rapidly succeeded one another. The thunder began to roll, and the wind, the precursor of a hurricane, whistled through the plumes and hair of the horsemen. The cavalcade broke into a fast trot. A little way beyond Formel's, the storm burst forth. There were still three leagues to travel, and they rode them amidst torrents of rain. D'Artagnan had taken off his hat and did not wear his cloak. He found some pleasure in letting the water flow over his burning brow and around his body, agitated by the heats of fever. At the moment that the little troop had passed beyond Goscal and was just arriving at the change house, a man who, in the darkness, had been confounded with the trunk of a tree under which he had sheltered himself advanced into the middle of the road, placing his finger on his lips. Athos recognized Grimaud. "'What's the matter now?' exclaimed D'Artagnan. "'Can she have quitted Armentieres?' Grimaud gave an affirmative nod of the head. D'Artagnan ground his teeth. "'Silence, D'Artagnan,' said Athos. I have taken charge of everything, and it is my business, therefore, to question Grimaud. Where is she? demanded Athos. Grimaud stretched forth his hand in the direction of the lease. Is it far from here? Grimaud presented his forefinger bent. Alone? demanded Athos. Grimaud made a sign that she was. Gentlemen, said Athos, she is half a league from this place in the direction of the river. Good, said D'Artagnan. Lead us on, Grimaud. Grimaud took a crossroad and guided the cavalcade. At the end of about 500 yards, they found a stream which they forded. By the light of a flash, they perceived the village of Equenheim. Is it there? demanded D'Artagnan. Grimaud shook his head negatively. Silence there, said Athos. The troop proceeded on its way. Another flash blazed forth, and by the bluish glare of the serpentine flame, a small, solitary house was perceptible on the bank of the river, not far from a ferry. There was a light at one window. "'We're there,' said Athos. At that moment, a man, who was lying down in a ditch, arose. It was Mosquiton. He pointed with his finger to the window with the light. "'She's there,' said he. "'And Bazin?' demanded Athos." While I watched the window, he watched the door. Good, said Athos, you are all faithful servants. Athos leaped from his horse, of which he gave the bridle into the hands of Grimaud, and advanced in the direction of the window, after having made a sign to the remainder of the troop to proceed towards the door. The small house was surrounded by a quick-set hedge of two or three feet in height. Athos sprang over the hedge and went up to the window, which had no shutters on the outside, but whose short curtains were closely drawn. He climbed upon the ledge of the stone that his eye might be above the level of the curtains. By the light of a lamp, he could perceive a woman, covered by a dark-colored cloak, seated on a stool before an expiring fire. 
Her elbows were placed upon a mean table, and she rested her head on hands which were as white as ivory. Her face was not visible, but an ominous smile arose upon the lips of Athos. He was not mistaken. He had, in truth, found the woman that he sought. At this moment, a horse neighed. Her ladyship raised her head, saw the pale face of Athos staring through the window, and screamed aloud. Perceiving that he had been seen, Athos pushed the window with his hand and knee. It gave way, the panes were broken, and Athos, like a specter of vengeance, leaped into the room. Her ladyship ran to the door and opened it. Paler and more threatening than even Athos himself, D'Artagnan was standing on the sill. Her ladyship started back and screamed. D'Artagnan, imagining that she had some means of flight and fearing that she might escape them, drew a pistol from his belt, but Athos raised his hand. Replace your weapon, D'Artagnan, said he. It is imperative that this woman should be judged and not assassinated. Wait a while, D'Artagnan, and you shall be satisfied. Come in, gentlemen. D'Artagnan obeyed, for Athos had the solemn voice and the authoritative air of a judge commissioned by the deity himself. Behind D'Artagnan there came Porthos, Aramis, Lord de Winter, and the man in the red cloak. The four valets watched at the door and window. Her ladyship had sunk upon her seat with her hands stretched out as if to exorcise this terrible apparition. On seeing her brother-in-law, she uttered a fearful scream. "'What do you want?' demanded her ladyship. "'We want Anne de Brule, who was called first the Countess de la Fere, then Lady de Winter, Baroness of Sheffield.' "'I'm that person,' murmured she, overwhelmed with surprise. "'What do you want with me?' "'We want to judge you according to your crimes,' said Athos. "'You will be free to defend yourself and to justify your conduct if you can. "'Monsieur d'Artagnan, you must be the first accuser.' "'D'Artagnan came forward. "'Before God and men,' said he, "'I accuse this woman of having poisoned Constance Bonancieux, "'who died last night.' He turned toward Aramis and Porthos. We can bear witness to it, said the two musketeers together. D'Artagnan continued, Before God and before men, I accuse this woman of having sought to poison me with some wine, which she sent from Villeroi with a forged letter, as if the wine had come from my friends. God preserved me, but a man named Brismont was killed instead of me. We bear witness to this, said Porthos and Aramis, as with one voice. Before God and men, continued D'Artagnan, I accuse this woman of having urged me to the murder of the Baron de Vards, and, as no one is present to bear witness to it, I myself will attest it. I have done. And D'Artagnan crossed over to the other side of the room with Porthos and Aramis. It is now for you to speak, my lord, said Athos. The baron came forward in his turn. Before God and before men, said he, I accuse this woman of having caused the Duke of Buckingham to be assassinated. The Duke of Buckingham assassinated? exclaimed all with one accord. Yes, said the baron, assassinated. From the warning letter which you sent me, I caused this woman to be arrested and put her under the custody of a faithful dependent. She corrupted that man, she placed the dagger in his hand, she made him kill the duke, and at this moment, perhaps, Felton has paid with his head for the crimes of this fury. A shudder ran through the company at the revelation of this hitherto unsuspected crime. That is not all, resumed Lord de Winter. My brother, who had made you his heiress, died in three hours of a strange malady, which left livid spots on his body. "'Sister, how did your husband die?' "'Oh, horror!' exclaimed Porthos and Aramis. "'Assassin of Buckingham, assassin of Felton, assassin of my brother, "'I demand justice on you, and declare that, if it be not accorded to me, "'I will execute it myself.' "'Lord de Winter ranged himself by the side of D'Artagnan, "'leaving his place open to another accuser. "'Her ladyship's head sank upon her hands,' and she endeavored to recall her thoughts, which were confounded by a deadly vertigo. "'It is now my turn,' said Athos, 
trembling as the lion trembles at the aspect of a serpent. It is my turn. I married this woman when she was a young girl. I married her against the desire of all my family. I gave her my property. I gave her my name. And one day I discovered that this woman was branded. This woman bore the mark of a fleur-de-lis upon the left shoulder. Oh, said her ladyship, rising, I defy you to find the tribunal which pronounced on me that infamous sentence. I defy you to find the man who executed it. Silence, exclaimed a voice. It is for me to answer that. And the man in the red cloak came forward. Who is that man? What is that man? cried out her ladyship, suffocated with terror, and with her hair rising itself up on her head as if it had been endowed with life. Every eye was turned toward that man, for he was unknown to all except Athos, and even Athos looked at him with as much astonishment as the others, for he knew not how he could be connected with the horrible drama which was at that moment enacting there. After slowly and solemnly approaching her ladyship till the table alone separated them, the stranger took off his mask. Her ladyship looked for some time with increasing terror on that pale countenance, fringed with black hair of which the only expression was that of a stern and frozen insensibility, then suddenly rising and retreating towards the wall. Oh, no, no, exclaimed she. No, it's an infernal apparition. It's not he. Help, help, she screamed out in a hoarse voice, still pressing against the wall as if she could open a passage through it with her hands. But who are you? exclaimed all the witnesses of this scene. Ask this woman, said the man in the red cloak, for you see well that she's recognized me. The executioner of Lil, the executioner of Lil, cried her ladyship, overcome by wild affright, and clinging to the wall with her hands for support. All present recoiled, and the tall man stood alone in the middle of the room. Oh, mercy, mercy, cried the miserable woman, falling on her knees. The stranger paused for silence. I told you truly that she recognized me, said he. Yes, I am the executioner of Lil, and here is my history. All eyes were fixed upon this man, whose words were listened to with the most anxious avidity. This woman was formerly a young girl, as beautiful as she is at present. She was a nun and a Benedictine convent at Templemar. A young priest, simple and ingenuous in his nature, performed service in the church of the convent. She attempted to seduce him and succeeded. She would have seduced a saint. The vows which they had both taken were sacred and irrevocable. She persuaded him to quit the country but to quit the country, to fly together, to get some part of France where they might live in peace because they would be unknown, they required money. Neither of them had any. The priest stole the sacred vessels and sold them, but just as they were making ready to escape, they were both arrested. In eight days more, she had corrupted the jailer's son and saved herself. The young priest was condemned to be branded and to ten years of the galleys, I was the executioner of Lil, as this woman says. I was obliged to brand the criminal, and that criminal was my own brother. I then swore that this woman who had ruined him, who was more than his accomplice since she had urged him to the crime, should at any rate partake his punishment. I suspected where she was concealed. I followed and discovered her. I bound her and imprinted the same brand on her that I had stamped upon my own brother. The next day, on my return to Lille, my brother also managed to escape. I was accused as his accomplice and was condemned to remain in prison in his place so long as he should continue at large. My poor brother was not aware of this sentence. He had rejoined this woman and they fled together into Barry, where he obtained a small curacy. This woman passed for his sister. The owner of the estate to which the curacy belonged saw this pretended sister and fell in love with her. His passion led him to propose to marry her. She left the man whom she had destroyed and became the Countess de la Fere. All eyes were turned toward Athos, whose true name this was, and he made a sign that the executioner's tale was true. 
Then, continued the latter, maddened by despair and resolved to terminate an existence of which the happiness and honor had been thus destroyed, my poor brother returned to Lille, and learning the sentence which had condemned me in his place, he delivered himself up to justice and hung himself on the same night to the grating of his dungeon. After all, to be fair to them, they who had condemned me kept their word. Scarcely was the identity of the dead body proved before my liberty was restored. These are the crimes of which I accuse her. These are the reasons why I branded her. Monsieur d'Artagnan, said Athos, what is the punishment that you demand for this woman? The punishment of death, replied d'Artagnan. My lord de Winter, continued Athos, what punishment do you demand for this woman? Death, replied her lo his lordship. Messieurs Porthos and Aramis, said Athos, you who are her judges, what punishment do you pronounce against this woman? The punishment of death, replied the two musketeers in a hollow voice. Her ladyship uttered a fearful cry and dragged herself a few paces on her knees toward her judges. Athos stretched out his hand toward her. Anne de Broil, said he, Countess de la Fere, Lady de Winter, your crimes have wearied men on earth and God in heaven. If you know any prayer, repeat it, for you are condemned and are about to die. At these words, which left no hope, her ladyship raised herself to her full height and attempted to speak. But her voice failed her. She felt a strong and pitiless hand seize her by the hair and drag her on as irresistibly as fate drags on mankind. She did not, therefore, even attempt to make any resistance, but left the cottage. Lord de Winter and the four friends went out after her. The valets followed their masters, and the chamber was left empty with its broken window, its open door, and the smoking lamp burning sadly on the table.